Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our live seminar series for today. I am Olivia Lanes, and I am your host for this afternoon from IBM Quantum. And I'm very excited to be able to introduce today's speaker, Christophe Pivetu, who will be talking to us about error mitigation for universal gates on encoded qubits. But let's just give everybody a few minutes to tune in. Feel free to tell me where you're tuning in from today before we get started. And then I'll uh, bring Christophe up to the stage and we'll, we'll get started in just a minute. Um, let's see, I got a lot of people from Columbia here today. That's awesome. Hello. I am uh, currently in my apartment in New York. Uh, got some people from Mexico. See, Edward is uh, <laughs> from IBM, uh, but out in California. Brazil, Maryland, all over the place. Not too unusual for us. I'll just give everybody one more minute here. Okay, awesome. Hello from France. All right, hi everybody. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. All right, hi everyone. We are thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. I am your host for today. My name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum. Uh, the seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and is hosted on the Kiskit YouTube channel right here. So feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. I am very excited to be able to introduce today's speaker. Uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce him briefly, then we'll bring him onto the stage and we will get started. So Christophe Pivetu received his bachelor's degree in physics and math and a master's degree in physics from ETH Zurich. Currently he is pursuing a PhD at ETH Zurich in the domain of quantum information theory. He received the ETH medal for his master's thesis on quantum error mitigation, which he did in collaboration with the quantum theory and applications group at IBM Research Zurich. He was also awarded the best paper award at the International Memory Workshop in 2019 for his work on in-memory computing. So Christoph, how are you doing today? Thanks so much for being here. Hi, I'm good, thanks, how are you? I'm good. Um, I think we're ready to get started. So I'm going to let you take it away here in just a second. I just wanted to remind everybody, please feel free to ask questions throughout and I will do my best to very politely interrupt you um, when those questions arise. And then we can also save some time at the end, if there's time, um, to have a little bit of discussion as well. So go ahead, take it from here. Sounds perfect. Thanks a lot for the very nice introduction. And thanks also for, for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, IBM Quantum Seminar series, also as a, as a speaker. So uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about some research work that uh, I did while I was affiliated with, with IBM Research Zurich, together with uh, my colleagues, uh, David Sutter, who's also from, from Zurich, and uh, from the American side of IBM, Sergey Bravi, Jay Gambetta, and Kristan Temme. So maybe just a small comment uh, before I start. Everything I'm going to talk about today is, is more or less based on, on some recent paper that we put on the archive. So if after the end of the presentation you, you, you'd like to have some more details or have some more uh, questions, you can also, of course, have a, a look at the paper there. So the title of our work is Air Mitigation for Universal Gates on Encoded Qubits. And it's, kind of contains uh, two different concepts in that title. It contains error mitigation and quantum error correction. So before I really get started about the topic itself, I'd like to spend just a little bit of time to, to get familiar with these two top, uh, these two uh, domains and, and explain really what, what they are, what to expect from them and what their relation is. So for this, um, I've prepared this this very crude uh, like timeline of the field of quantum computation. So we are here on, on, on the left. So nowadays we already have quantum computers, right? IBM has built lots of, of quantum computers and you can already like go on the cloud and, and uh, program some really cool quantum circuits like drag and drop uh, the, the gates into your circuit and then actually run the, the circuit somewhere on, on, on some quantum computer that is I guess in, in, in some basement of some lab somewhere at IBM. So it's really cool. If, uh, you should definitely try that out if you haven't done so yet. Uh, but if you, if you do so, you, you might realize very quickly that 
um, if, if you run circuits that are too large, uh, you, you start sampling a lot of noise. So effectively, if, you're, if you're, uh, the depth of your circuit is too large, uh, the, the measurement outcomes become very, become very random due to the noise and the errors on the hardware. And this fundamentally has to do with the fact that quantum information is, is much more sensitive than classical information. And uh, due to, 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 to this problem, uh, it, it's extremely hard to use these current um, quantum computers to show any kind of quantum advantage on, on a useful task. And when I say useful task here, I mean something like quantum chemistry, machine learning, optimizations, these kinds of problems that people might in, in the future want to buy a quantum computer for, right? So um, this, this problem with, with noise, of course, uh, has been known forever. And um, uh, already in the 90s, people have, have realized what's probably going to be the most likely avenue to, to, to deal with these problems. And the technique uh, that we're going to use at some point in the far future is called quantum error correction. So the, the big idea of quantum error correction is that you somehow redundantly um, encode your quantum information. That means instead of you, you, one logical qubit gets encoded, for example, in many, many physical qubits, maybe thousands of uh, physical qubits. And the intuition behind that is that if you have some kind of noise, some kind of errors that happen on a few of your physical qubits, somehow uh, you will still be able to recover like the logical information that was originally stored in the system. And um, uh, right, and, and if your quantum computer is, 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 is good enough, if you have low enough noise, then there's this threshold theorem. It's actually more like really a, a family of theorems, which, which tell you that it's possible to, to uh, realize um, reliable computation of, of arbitrary length on your, on your noisy quantum computer, basically by just throwing enough physical qubits uh, at, at your problem. So one example of an error correction code, which is uh, very well known uh, because it has lots, lots of nice properties, is the so-called surface code. So here I put a, uh, on the bottom a picture of, of, of such a surface code, like all the, the, the white qubits are, are like data qubits, which form like one big logical qubit. And all these red and green plaquettes are, are like X and Z type stabilizers that you have to regularly measure. And from these measurement outcomes, you try to infer somehow what kinds, what kind of error happened on your hardware, and you can try to correct through these errors. So unfortunately, quantum error correction is extremely hard to realize experimentally. It has lots of, of requirements on your, on your quantum computer that current quantum computers are just, just do not fulfill. And it's probably going to take quite a while until we get to that point, right? But if we reach that stadium where we have this universal fault-tolerant uh, quantum computer with, with quantum error correction that has uh, many, many uh, logical qubits, we already have quite a few ideas what kind of useful things you could do with this computer, right? So now th the natural question then, then is like, do we have to wait until we, we somehow reach this threshold, until we can do something useful with a quantum computer that, that outperforms a classical computer? And out of this question, the, the, the field of quantum error mitigation really emerged. And uh, typically, the, the idea of these error mitigation techniques is, is that they, tr they are very hardware friendly. They're much easier to realize than quantum error correction. And typically, they, they try to remove the noise-induced bias on, on, on the measurement outcomes that you observe on, 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 on your hardware. So uh, they're, they're not meant to be like a replacement for quantum error correction, right? Typically, they have some kind of bad scaling because they, they don't really um, prolong the coherence time of your, of your qubits. But they're just some, some nifty tricks that you can use in order to, to, to reduce uh, the impact of the noise that you have on, on this near-term near hardware. And the hope is that maybe thanks to this error mitigation technique, we might still be able to, to to demonstrate some kind of quantum advantage on a, again, quote unquote, useful task uh, before we, we reach these, this uh, distant uh, fault tolerant regime on the right. So you might have heard uh, from, from different quantum error mitigation techniques before, like error, 
error extrapolation or subspace, subspace expansion or like symmetry verification. Uh, but today I'd like to focus on, on, on the, another quantum error mitigation technique, which is called the quasi probability method. And it will be a, a central ingredient uh, basically for, for most of the talk today. And to, to give you a ve very high level picture first of, of what I'd like to, to, to convince you today or what I'd like to propose to you today is that um, it can be very fruitful to take uh, concepts and ideas and techniques from, from the domain of error mitigation and from the domain of quantum error correction and combine them together, right? Because typically people consider these two things as like separate techniques that don't really mix well. And, that, and, and today I'd like to argue that uh, there can be a lot of benefit if you try to look at them together and, and, and mix some concepts from, from both of them. So this might be now a little bit confusing, right? Because I just told you, well, quantum error correction uh, is, is so hard to realize. So why would we ever want to mix quantum error mitigation with quantum error correction if you cannot realize quantum error correction? And the truth is that uh, there, that of course, <laughs> the truth is always a little bit more subtle, more complicated. And in fact, when you look at quantum error correction, there are different parts of, of realizing this fault on fault on universal quantum computer, which uh, where some parts are easier and some parts are harder to realize. So to talk about this a little bit more specific, I'd like to, to give like a very conceptual, so really this is con a conceptual step-by-step um, -step, um, explanation how we can go from a bare noisy quantum computer that we have today to this fault tolerant universal quantum computer with quantum error correction some, somewhat in the future. And like, I'd like to, 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 to see which, which of these steps are going to be easier and which are going to be harder, right? So the first step, conceptually you can think of as being uh, protecting your logical qubits from noise. So what does it mean? Um, we, we want to have a fault tolerant quantum memory. That means that uh, we, we, we encode our, our logical quantum information in some kind of, of, of error correction code and we repeatedly um, perform some syndrome measurements and from the syndrome measurements we try to, to figure out what errors happened and try to correct for these errors, right? We, we, do, we do not do any computation. So already for this, the hardware requirements are, are, are very, uh, very high, and uh, this is very difficult to, to, to realize experimentally. So you need, of course, a large number of physical qubits uh, to realize your logical qubits. You need to have very high fidelity gates. And there's also a lot of different difficulties you need to, to be able to do to, to, to fast measurements, fast uh, repeated measurements. And somehow you need to have some efficient decoder, which can take these measurement outcomes and very quickly decide what kind of correction operator you want to apply and so on. And, um, but, but experimentalists have, have recently been, been working towards these goals and there are definitely plans, uh, to, to, to achieve them in the, at least somewhat near future. So as an example, uh, let, let me show this, this, um, the slide that I think IBM published uh, some sometimes last year, uh, where they show what is like their the roadmap for for the number of qubits that they want to pack on through their chips. And so, for example, by 2023, they plan to have a, more than a thousand qubits on a single chip, and even more beyond that. And I'm sure that like the other big names, Google and, and so on, are also uh, on on a similar track. So we can hope that maybe in the somewhat near future we might be able to to. To, to realize uh, this, this full-tone quantum memory. But of course, a full-tone quantum memory is not enough, right? We, we want to have a computer at the end that can do computation and not only store quantum information, right? So in order to do computation with quantum error correction codes, you need to realize logical gates. So there's really two families of gates you can think of. There's like Clifford gates and non-Clifford gates. Uh, some example of Clifford gates are the Pauli gates, the Hadamard, the S gates, the Sinoc gate. And some examples for non Clifford gates would, for example, be the T gate or the Toffoli gate. And as it turns out, uh, when you want to realize logical uh, gates on, 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 on your uh, error correction codes, Clifford gates typically tend to be much easier to realize than non Clifford gates. So, of course, I'm, I'm I'm, washing, I'm, I'm glossing over lots of details, but this uh, generally has to do with, with the idea that of, of trans
transversality, namely that some kind of gates, namely Clifford gates typically, can be implemented in a transversal manner, which means that somehow they do, you, you have a guarantee that they do not spread er errors too much around uh, your, your chip, right? If you have an error on, on one qubit of your chip and you uh, realize a, a, a transverse logical gate, then you have the guarantee that after that logical gate, the error has not spread too much. Whereas if your logical gate you like to realize is not, not transversal, typically that means that uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to control the noise and uh, error correction becomes extremely difficult, basically. And unfortunately, Clifford gates are not enough, right? Because they are not universal. Universal meaning that uh, you cannot decompose a general unitary only into Clifford gates. And in fact, it's even worse than that, right? Because Clifford, it, it turns out that a circuit that only contains Clifford gates uh, can be simulated efficiently with the, with the classical computer, right? So if you want to have any kind of quantum advantage of our, of our quantum computer compared to, to a classical computer, we absolutely need to have these non-Clifford gates. So one, one theorem that kind of encapsulates uh, the, this difficulty is the so-called Easton Mill theorem, which is a kind of no-go theorem that says that um, there exists no quantum error correction code that um, can implement a universal uh, set of gates transversely. So this is really a, a, a big problem. So to, to summarize, I would argue that there are like two steps here to, 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 to take from the fault tolerant quantum memory. First, we have this fault tolerant Clifford quantum computer. That means a quantum computer that can only do logical Clifford gates. And this step is easier to realize, and then you have the step to a fault tolerant universal quantum computer, where you at least also need to be uh, able to realize non Clifford gates. And this step turns out to be much, much harder. So, um, of course, this problem of, of, of realizing non uh, non Clifford gates uh, has, has been studied a lot, and people have come up with many, many very creative ways how you can try to circumvent this Easton Mill theorem. And one of these ways, which uh, is very commonly studied and very com commonly considered is, is, is so-called magic state injection. So as it turns out, um, if, you, if, if you have a quantum computer that can do Clifford gates and can also do T gates, right? Which uh, as I mentioned before is is, is, is a non Clifford gate that is already enough to have a universal gate set, right? So if we can realize Clifford gates and T gates, then we are more powerful than a classical computer. So um, we would like to realize T gates full tolerantly somehow, and this can be realized by by following circuit here. So uh, you you take a magic state. A magic state is just a, a single qubit state, uh, which is defined as follows. You, you apply the C naught, you measure one of the two qubits, and depending on the measurement outcome being zero or one, you, you uh, either apply this X and S gates, and notice that like the C naught, S and X are all Clifford gates, so you, you can do them for tolerantly. And uh, if, if you do the computation, you can realize that this gadget effectively realizes a T gate. So you, you should really think of these two qubit lanes, the two qubits involved in the circuit as being logical qubits here, right? Not, not physical qubits, just to be clear. Right. Uh, so basically, because every time we, we, we now want to, to execute a T gate on our chip, right, on some, on some circuit, we need to consume one of these magic states. So somehow we need to be able to fault tolerantly prepare these magic states. So Maybe the circuit by itself doesn't do much yet because we, we just moved the problem of being able to realize fault tolerant T gates to being able to fault tolerantly prepare magic states. Okay, so how, how do we prepare these magic states? So there's been this technique called magic state distillation, which was uh, pioneered by, by uh, Bravi and Kitaev, which um, is basically this process, which I uh, depicted with the machine here, that takes many uh, low, lower fidelity magic states, noisy magic states, 
and uh, purifies them in a certain way, sense and, and produces uh, fewer but higher fidelity magic states. And if you repeat this process iteratively many, many times, you can, you can get uh, magic states of very high precision, which are, uh, you can then inject into your circuit. So I'm not going to go into detail exactly how this work, works, but, um, but, but when, when people try to, to design actual, or, or like to think about how in the on chips, typically they, 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 they reserve one portion of the chip to be only there to, to, to produce magic states, right? And they call this sometimes a magic state factory, right? This part of the chip, the only job of this part of the chip is going to be to churn out this, this magic state as quickly as possible, because the rest of the chip where you actually execute your circuit of interest is going to uh, consume one of these magic states every time that you execute a T-gate. And as it turns out, these, these magic state distillation factories are, first of all, they're extremely complex, and they come also with, with, a, with a significant overhead, right? As I told you, most likely a, a large portion of your chip is only going to be used to produce these magic states for these T gates. So uh, it is it is very plausible uh, that in, in, in the near uh, it's it's always difficult to predict the future. So I tried to to formulate this in a little bit of a, caref a careful manner, but it's very plausible that uh, at some point we, we will be in the situation that we might have like this fault tolerant Clifford quantum computer. But due to the complexity and, and overhead of, of the magic state distillation, we cannot really uh, consider any, any, any interesting circuits, either because we cannot uh, do any T gates or because the overhead of the T gate is so large that we cannot actually even look at, at uh, circuits of any, any kind of interesting size. So the, the, the idea that we present in our research work is basically to realize this last step, right? The step of going from a full-term Clifford quantum computer to the full-term universal quantum computer using quantum error mitigation. So we, we, don't have, we don't need to use any of these magic state distillation factories. We don't need to, 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 to have all this complexity and overhead. Uh, instead, we use uh, error mitigation in order to, 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 to reach this last step, which hopefully should be much more hardware friendly. So uh, with that out of the way, uh, let me give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk uh, about for the rest of my, of my presentation. So first of all, I'm going to introduce you to the quasar probability method, which is uh, one specific error mitigation technique, which we're going to focus today in, the, on, 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 in this talk. And then I'm going to explain to you how you can combine this quasar probability method together with, with quantum error correction. And basically, we're going to um, look at noisy logical T gates, and we're going to error mitigate the noise of these lo noisy uh, logical T gates. So, I'm, more precisely, we're going to look at two specific variants how this can be done. When, in one variant, we're going to make use of, of noisy magic states, whereas in the other variant, we're going to use something that is called code switching. And both of these variants will be uh, somewhat illustrated on the surface code. Then I'd like to discuss a little bit about how far we can go with this method, what are the limits, and uh, at the very end, I'm, I'm going to conclude uh, about the important points in my, my presentation. So with that, uh, let's get started on the quasi-probability method. So the, the quasi-probability method, uh, so the idea of, of quasi-probabilities has been around in, in, in many different forms already for a very long time. But the idea to use uh, quasi-probabilities uh, as, as a means to do quantum error mitigation was pioneered by, by um, the colleagues at IBM, Chris and Temme, Sergey Bravi, and Jay Gambetta in 2017. So the goal of the quasi-probability method is to correct the bias that you get in expectation values of, of, of measurement outcomes. And the way how the quasi probability method works is that in every shot of your circuit that you execute, you're going to somehow randomly alter your, 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 your circuit, basically by changing some of the gates, maybe adding some gates, removing some gates, just you change the, the, the circuit in a random way, and then you average the, the outcome um, 
that you get from, from every alteration of the circuit, basically. So here on the bottom, I, I put some, some pictures from Song et al, which uh, provided, uh, I think, the first experimental um, realization of, of the quasi-probability method. So here on the left, you can see like the, the original circuit that they want to error mitigate. So this is a very, very simple circuit. You have two qubits in a plus state. You do some kind of, of controlled uh, Z uh, rotation, and then you measure one of the qubits. Let me jump already here on the right side. You can see what is uh, the, the ideal expectation value of that measurement outcome, uh, depending on the, the value phi of that rotation, right? That would be this black line here. Now, if you just take this circuit here on the left, and you try to realize it as is on, on, on the quantum computer that, that they had, uh, you would get these blue points here. And you see that due to the noisy nature of their quantum computer, um, they, the expectation value that they observed was significantly, significantly off the, the value that it should have been if, it, if there were not any noise. So what, what they did basically, they, they use a quasi-probability method and they, at every shot of the circuits, which I think here they, they denoted by instance, they somehow alter, altered the, the circuit in, 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 a, in a very specific way, such that when, when you correctly uh, sum up all the, the, expect the, 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 the results from these measurements and weight them in the, in the correct fashion, you, you, can, uh, cor you, you can get expectation value that exactly uh, corrects for the noise that is present on your system. So basically, uh, these red points that you see here, this is uh, with the quasi-probability method. You might notice th they call it probabilistic error cancellation. That's just a different name for the quasi-probability method. So this might seem a little bit surprising now, right? And, and, and I'm going to explain to you exactly how you, you choose these random circuits such that you can compensate for the noise, because you have to choose them, of course, in, in an extremely specific manner such that uh, this noise cancellation works. Christoph, really quick, is that area on the circuit in blue the part of the circuit that you're randomizing? Exactly, yes. Okay. Cool, thanks. So for this purpose, let, let's consider pretty much this, the, the simplest setting for the quasi-probability method. We have some gate U somewhere in our circuit that uh, we want to error mitigate, right? The ideally, this gate U should take pure states psi and map them to the to state U times psi, right? But in, in, in quantum information theory or in quantum computing, when noise is involved, the language how you describe the evolution, the time evolution of the state is in the language of quantum channels. So the, the gate that we have in our circuit, ideally, if, if there were no noise present, if we had a perfect quantum computer, the evolution of the state should be described by this ideal unitary quantum channel, which I denote by brackets U, which, which is written down here. But of course, on our real quantum computer, when we, when we uh, somehow realize the gate in the hardware in, in, in some way or another, the time evolution that actually takes place is not the perfect ideal time evolution. It's described by some other quantum channel, uh, which I called E here, which is noisy. So um, let, let's let's try to take the simplest example of, of the uh, to to illustrate the quasi probability method. We're going to consider a circuit that contains one single uh, gate, and the quasi probability method is always formulated uh, such that at the end of your circuit, you care about some expectation value. So for the simplest example, we we, we have a circuit with a single gate U, and then we measure the the observable O. Uh, on, on this output state of the, of the gate U, right? So by, by, by the postulates of quantum mechanics, the, the expectation value that you would like to obtain is described by this number here. It's the trace of, of the measurement operator times uh, the state uh, that you get out of, your, uh, out of your gate. And of course, because we, there is noise present on your hardware, if you just take this gate, uh, this circuit, and, and, and try to naively realize it on the hardware, you're going to obtain the wrong expectation value. You're going to obtain this number here, which, which is generally going to be different than the number that we want here. So the quasi-probability method will really allow us to compute this ideal expectation value, that means the one with the ideal green uh, channel, 
even if you only have access to noise economy channels. So how, how does that work? So um, the central ingredient for the quasi-probability method is to find a so-called quasi-probability decomposition. So quasi-probability decomposition is basically nothing else than, than a fancy word of saying we, we express our, our ideal quantum channels as uh, our ideal quantum channel as a, as, a, as a sum, as a weighted sum of some other channels EI. And these coefficients here AI are just real numbers. And now this EI should not be just any kind of quantum channels. They should be quantum channels that you know that your hardware can realize. So for example, um, what, you would, what you would do in practice is that you, you would go to your hardware, you would uh, try lots of different noisy gates, noisy measurements, combinations of measurement and gates, right? And, and you would do tomography of those uh, in order to know what kind of, 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 of quantum channels your, your, your computer can, can realize. And this gives you a set of, of quantum channels EI that you know your quantum computer can realize. And then you try to find some coefficients AI such that you get such a valid quasi-probability decomposition. So uh, for those who are more interested in, in the technical details, the way how you compute these coefficients AI is, is, is by what is called a linear program. And uh, there's one very important quantity uh, for, for such a quasi-probability decomposition, that's the so-called gamma factor. It's basically the sum of the absolute value of AIs. And in, in, in a certain sense, it, 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 um, it, it, it characterizes the quality of your quasi-probability decomposition. Why exactly that's the case, uh, we'll see that in, in, in a few slides. But I, I think it's important already to, to mention here so you can recognize later on exactly what the gamma factor is. And in a certain sense, you can think the gamma factor as being a measure of the negativity of the quasi probability decompositions, because the, the, the coefficients AI, you can quickly see that they must sum up to one, but they can also be negative, right? They don't have to be positive. So because of that, gamma can be seen as a measure of negativity of the decomposition. Okay, we have a quasi probability decomposition, but why is that useful? Well, we can take this quasi-probability decomposition and plug that into the formula I had on, last, on the last slide for, for this ideal expectation value, right, that we want to, to get out of the quasi-probability method. So basically, we would like these coefficients AI to look a little bit more like a probability average, right, because right now they, they are just any real numbers that can be negative. And that's a little bit problematic. So what we do, we separate AI into the absolute value of AI and multiply it by the sign of AI. And by this very simple algebraic trick, we get this equation here on the bottom, which uh, might seem very complicated, but let me just take that to the next slide because this equation is now exactly going to explain to us what the quasar probability method actually does. Right. So. As, as you remember, this, this number here on the left side is exactly the ex ideal expectation value that you want to compute at the end. And, and um, what, what this equation tells us is that we can write it as a um, probability weighted average of some quantity, which means that we can sample it using uh, Monte Carlo techniques. So this is just a very fancy word to say that um, at every shot of our quantum circuit, we're going to replace the gate U by one of the, the channels EI that we that is part of the quasi-probability decomposition. And the probability that we uh, choose uh, uh, one of these single channels EI is given by this probability PI, which, which depends on the coefficients of your quasi-probability decomposition. And then you, you measure the outcome of, of, of that circuit. And another important part, you, you weight the measurement outcome according to, to this purple factor here which uh, turns out to depend on the choice of, of channels uh, that you did, right? On the random uh, channel that, that you sampled. And this, this equation now on top tells you that if, if you do this procedure many, many, many times, and you, you average the, the outcome that you receive from that procedure in every different shot, right? Over many, many shots, uh, then you can, uh, you, you will get the, the precise expectation value that, you would, that you, you would have if there was no noise present on the hardware. Right, so let, let me just say that again, just 
because this is an important point, the quasi probability method, in principle, it would allow us to, to estimate the ideal expectation value of our quantum circuits to arbitrary precision just by throwing more shots at our, uh, at our problem, which is, which is a classical resource in a certain sense. So this might sound a little bit too good to be true. And that's also because <laughs> in a certain way it is, because um, as it turns out, it, it might happen that you, well, in principle, you can, you, you, you can get uh, an arbitrary good estimate. The number of shots that you need to, to reach that estimate can become extremely large. And more precisely, the, the number of shots that you need to require, uh, to, that you require to fix, a, uh, to, that you require to reach a fixed precision scales, uh, square as gamma squared. Whereas you remember this, this gamma factor was, was, was the quality of a cause probability decomposition I was, I was mentioning before. And in fact, things are even a little bit worse. This is not yet the full picture because uh, I, I was talking now about a very simple example where you have single uh, gate in your circuit and you correct only that single gate. But if, but in reality, this is of course not true, right? You are, in your quantum circuits, you're going, to, you're going to have many, many gates, and you're going to want to error mitigate every single, every individual one of these gates. And uh, so, so what's what's going to happen is that at every shot of your quantum circuit for every gate, you're going to 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 randomly uh, choose one of the corresponding quantum channels for that gate, and and you're going to replace it with that, and you're going to weight the measurement outcome at the end of your total circuit according to all the ind uh, individual random samples that you did along the way, right? And as it turns out, the the gamma factor of the total circuit. Scales uh, is, is is given by the, the the multiplication of every individual gamma factor of every individual gate in in your circuit, which uh, concretely more concretely means that the the number of shots at the end that you need to do to to correct uh, a quantum circuit scales exponentially in the number of gates that you have in that circuit. So at this Good point, question. I'd like to call. So, oh, sorry, first off, we had a question no, from sorry. the previous slide. Go ahead. How are the values of AI chosen? So, um, the values of AI are chosen according to to uh, an optimization pro um, uh, problem. Basically, you want to choose the set of coefficients AI that minimize the gamma factor as much as possible, and this can be expressed. Uh, as a linear program, so it's it's an optimization problem that you can solve efficiently. Okay, cool, thanks. So at this point, I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, the drawbacks and of of of, of the quasi probability methods, and uh, because everything I, I talked about now seems very nice, but of course, when you try to actually realize these things on the actual hardware, uh, you there, there's always problems uh, that, that pop up. So the first of the, of the problem that I wrote down here, I already mentioned, is that the sampling overhead scales exponentially in the circuit size. And again, I'd like to reiterate here that this is why quantum error mitigation techniques are not meant to be a replacement for quantum error correction. They um, exhibit a significantly worse scaling and um, in, in the far off future, when we can do quantum error correction, it will be much better to actually do quantum error correction. But in the near term future, quantum, quantum error mitigation and the quasi probability method are interesting because they're much easier to realize with the hardware, right? You can just pay by, by running a few more shots, which is not, doesn't sound too bad, right? Just to, 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 to reduce uh, the, the effect of the noise on your quantum circuit. Another problem, uh, which some of you may be already thought about now is that uh, the quantum error mitigation technique uh, of the quasi probability method requires exact knowledge of the noise that is actually happening on the hardware. So any experimentalists of you out there who, who, who did tomography before probably already know that this is a very difficult process and that state preparation and measurement errors make your life very hard. And it's very hard to really know what kind of noise happens on your hardware. And this is this is a very big problem actually for the quasi probability method, and and the reason why why I'm mentioning these problems now is because at the later point in my presentation where we're going to combine error correction with error mitigation, a lot of these problems are are going to kind of solve themselves. They're, they they will be much less uh, harsh than they are now when we run the quasi probability method on the bare hardware. 
Another problem with the causal probability method is that it suffers from, from, from that, that it doesn't deal very well with crosstalk or correlated errors, right? When you have noise that's correlated in space and time, uh, then, then you get problems because basically the, the, the treatment of the causal probability method is what I was talking before, where you correct every individual gate, you have kind of this implicit assumption that the noise is IID, and that is in space and in time, which on the hardware is, is not true in, in many cases. And the final small comment is, is that uh, for, for general types of noise, um, a causal probability uh, decomposition might require some operations EI, which are non-unitary. So typically that means, for example, measurement operators. You need to randomly insert measurements into your, into your quantum circuits. And measurements are bad and not very hardware friendly because typically they're very long. And when you have a measurement of one qubit, all the other qubits have to decohere during that time because they, they're just standing idle. And that's just things you don't want to do. So um, at this point, I'm now going to switch to combine to, 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 to see how we can combine the causal probability method with quantum error correction. And we'll see how a lot of these problems uh, will, will be tackled in that case. So basically, the, the, the big difference uh, is, 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 actually, is actually a very small step. And we're going to say that this, log, this gate that we were considering before, right, this gate U, now it's not going to be a physical gate. It's going to be a logical gate. That means it's, 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 uh, it's a logical gate acting on many, many physical qubits. And we're going to work in, on, on the assumption that I was mentioning previously, that we already have a, a, a quantum computer that can uh, realize Clifford gates fault tolerantly, right? We have this fault tolerant Clifford quantum computer, but that cannot do fault tolerant non-Clifford gates. So, so consider we are given a Clifford plus T circuit, and uh, the Clifford part of the circuit we can do fault tolerantly, and the T gates we cannot do fault tolerantly. So we're going to realize them somehow in a noisy fashion. We'll see exactly how we realize them in a noisy fashion. And the idea is going to be that we're going to use the causal probability method to correct for that noise in, 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 in these uh, noisy logical T gates. So as I mentioned previously, I'm now going to show two separate variants how this could potentially be realized on the hardware. And the first uh, variant is basically going to use noisy magic state. So here I just drew again the same state injection circuit that I showed to you previously. And what we're going to do here, instead of, 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 of uh, using a, a perfect pole tolerant uh, magic state, we're instead going to plug in some noisy magic state, which has some infidelity, which I denote by epsilon bar here. And of course, if I don't put, uh, uh, put uh, an ideal magic state, but a noisy magic state into the circuit, then the realized T gate by the circuit is not going to be an ideal T gate, it's going to be a noisy T gate. But now comes really the trick. Thanks to the assumption that uh, we, we, we have a fault tolerant Clifford quantum computer and that we can do Clifford gates fault tolerantly, we can now twirl this magic state with the so-called A gate. So the A gate is a special type of, of, of Clifford gate, which is defined uh, with this equation here. And twirling in, 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 this, in, in this context means that at every shot of the circuit, you're basically gonna uh, throw a coin and if it's head, uh, you're going to do nothing. And if it's tail, you're going to apply an A gate here on your circuit. So every time you just a 50, 50 chance that you apply this A gate. And if you look, what is the effective state, uh, the effective noisy magic state that is produced thanks to this twirling, it's going to be in a very specific form. I mean, it's going to be in the form that is diagonal in, 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 uh, in the in the basis that contains the the magic state itself, and if you just propagate uh, that that noisy magic state uh, and, and the noise throughout the circuit, you will realize that the that the noisy magic that the noisy T gates that uh, we just produced has a noise of a very specific type. Namely, it's it's going to have Pauli Z noise, which, uh, as I wrote down here, just means that it's with probability one minus epsilon bar. It's the ideal. T gate and with probability epsilon bar, it's the ideal T gate followed by a Z flip. And thanks to, to, to this knowledge that uh, our noisy T gate has a very specific form, uh, it's now very straightforward to find a quasi probability decomposition of that uh, T gate. So we can express um, 
the, the ideal T gate, right? That's the ideal target unitary channel, which I denoted by brackets U earlier. Now it's the ideal T gate. I can write it as a sum. The exact coefficients are not very important. It's just a sum of the noisy uh, T gate and the noisy T gate followed by, by Z flip. And this is a quasi probability decomposition with, with the gamma factor, which scales as one over one minus two epsilon bar. So maybe uh, let me just recapitulate what, what, what just happened because it, it happened uh, rather quickly now. Uh, but it's, 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 it's uh, very interesting what happened. Thanks to the assumption that, um, that we can do Clifford gates fault tolerantly, we were able to twirl the magic state to have a very specific form of noise. And thanks to that, we, were, uh, we, we have the guarantee that our noisy T gate has a very specific form of noise, right? And we can already know what the uh, what was our probability decomposition of that noisy T gate we can use. This is completely different than what happens in in in, in the original version of the Q, uh, QPD method, right? There, I said you have to do lots of tomography, you have to understand how the noise works on your hardware, and you have to do all these these complicated steps. And hopefully, at the end, it's going to work. But here, it's completely different. We only have to figure out one single parameter, and that's this infidelity epsilon bar of your, of your noisy magic state. And once you know this one single parameter, uh, the, the, the whole technique is basically uh, well-defined, and you know exactly what to do. You don't need to do any kind of tomography. And in fact, this, this uh, infidelity of the, of, of the noisy magic state can be measured in a very simple manner that might be a little bit reminiscent to, to what you see, for example, in randomized benchmarking. We, you, you, you can um, take such a circuit as I drew here, where you prepare a, a logical plus state, and then you apply this noisy T gate uh, for P times on, on this plus state, and then you measure again in the plus minus basis. And you vary this number of, 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 of uh, gates P, and for every individual P, you, you, you plot what is like the expectation value of that circuit. And as it turns out, uh, this, this graph that you produce then, is going to decay exponentially in the number of, of steps p. So by basically doing an exponential fit, you can very uh, easily uh, find out what the what the parameter epsilon bar is. So no need for tomography at all. So um, now that we have the basic idea out of, out of the way, a, a very important question is now, well, how large is epsilon bar, this, this infidelity going to be uh, in, in practice in, on, on, the, on the real hardware? But how large can we expect it to be? Uh, because the, the value of epsilon bar is very important, right? Because it determines the gamma factor of our QPD, and the gamma factor determines how many shots we have to run of our circuit. So fortunately, this is a very well-studied problem because um, we're not the first ones who want to have high fidelity magic states, right? People who do, um, let's say, conventional magic state distillation also want to have an initial circuit that prepares raw magic states that are of high quality. So here, for example, I, I show some, some, some results which are from, from Ying Li, which I, I believe uh, back then was in the, the Simon Benjamin group, which showed this rather surprising result that um, the fidelity of, of, uh, of the magic state can be even higher than the, 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 the fidelities of the individual gates that produced that magic state. So basically what they showed in this paper is that the epsilon bar can be written uh, to low order approximation as, as, as this sum of like the two qubit uh, gate error probability, single qubit gate error probability and the initialization probability. So typically, P1 and PI are much smaller than P2. So this value P2 here uh, is very dominant on the right-hand side of this equation. So, uh, and, and, and they provide some numerical simulation where they show that um, the value of epsilon bar, which are these curves here, are even smaller than the value of P2 for even rather realistic values of, 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 uh, of gate error rates. Hey, Christoph, I didn't want to interrupt you, but we had a question on the previous slide again um, mm -hmm. from one of our IBM colleagues. Doesn't T, doesn't the T gate need to be applied in multiples of four? Yes, 
You're yes. absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this I, I glossed over this detail. You because yeah, well, good catch. <laughs> Sounds good. Right. So at this point, I'm gonna um, talk about the second variant, uh, which is using code switching. So, uh, well, the, the reason why we wanted to, to also look for, for a second variant, how we can realize uh, this, this early mitigation of logical T gates is because the first variant that I proposed you, I showed you in the previous slides, uh, still has some experimental difficulties that might make it a little bit difficult to realize in practice. So, first of all, it requires two logical qubits, and also all these protocols to prepare noisy magic states might be rather complicated. So, this protocol from Ying Li, for example, that I showed up, I think has a lot of like post selection and you have to repeat the process many times until um, until you get exactly what you want. So it's, it's just we wanted to have a second variant that that has less hardware complexity and that is maybe more more suitable for a first hardware realization. So the idea of this second uh, variant is, is following. Right, we have our, 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 our logical information that is stored a logical qubit, which is stored in quantum error correction code. And for a temporary amount of time, we're going to switch that code. You're going to change the code that our logical information is stored in to a new code. And in this new, co and this new code is such that the Z distance of this new code is one, right? Uh, so in, in, in different words, that means that uh, in this new code, there exists some physical qubit somewhere on your chip uh, such that the Z operation on this physical qubit is also a logical Z operator, uh, which is generally very bad for error correction because it means you're very prone to errors. But in our case, we want to use that because, as it turns out, if you just run a, a physical T gate on that single qubit that I that I mentioned, then this uh, physical T gate is also automatically going to be a logical T gate due to this very simple identity that you can. Uh, write the T gate as a, as a superposition, as a linear combination of the identity and the, and the Z gate. So, right. And, and then after we've done this, this logical T gate, uh, we immediately switch back to the original code. And you can maybe already imagine that this procedure is not going to be fault tolerant because for a short amount of time, we expose ourselves uh, to Z errors, right? Because we have a Z distance one. But interestingly, we're not prone to X errors because uh, the, the distance the, the X distance stays large during the whole process. So to give you a bit more of a concrete idea how this could look like, we, we in our paper, we, we worked out the explicit case how, how you could do that with the key type surface code. I'm not going to go into all details, but I'll give you a very brief idea. So we, we switch on the left, you have like this conventional key type surface code. And on the right, we have this asymmetric code where we basically on the top boundary removed every second uh, X stabilizer and we added uh, these Z stabilizers here, such that the, the top boundary basically just has like these blue edges. And uh, one can check that for this asymmetric uh, surface code, uh, the Z operator on this qubit here is, is uh, um, a logical Z operator. So basically we switch from the left code to the right code, we perform a physical uh, T gate on this qubit here, and then we switch back to the original code. So um, just to give you a little bit of a, of a flavor, uh, we, we, I, I show here some, some uh, numerical uh, simulation that we did. Is, so um, we simulated basically depolarizing noise on the system. We wanted to, to see what is like the probability of having a logical X error and a logical Z error uh, caused by, by our um, noisy logical uh, T gate. And you can see that the logical X errors uh, get our, first of all, they're very small and they get nicely suppressed by increasing the, 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 the distance of our code. Whereas if you look at the logical Z errors, uh, unfortunately, well, as expected, I, they, they do not decrease when you increase the distance. And from this simulation, you can uh, figure out that epsilon bar is roughly equals to 30 times epsilon. Just, just to iterate again, the reason why we're uh, not susceptible to, to X errors is because the X distance stays large throughout the whole process. Now, this is a very useful thing indeed, because it means that the logical noise that we have 
uh, due to that uh, noisy T gate is going to be purely of Z type. Like it, it might be coherent or incoherent, but it's only going to have Z type terms in that noise. Because of that, one can show uh, with, uh, with, the, with some twirling, which is a little bit more complex than the twirling that we had in the first variant, you can again guarantee that your noise is going to be nice of nice Pauli Z form. And therefore, uh, you can basically repeat the same procedure that I presented in the first variant, where you find uh, a QPD and, the, and where you only have to find one single parameter epsilon bar. So at this point, I'd like to talk a little bit about the limits of these methods or, or like how far can we go with it. So uh, if you look at the sampling overhead uh, at, at the gamma factor for, for, for every individual T gate that you want to error mitigate, uh, you can derive with, uh, that for both variants that I showed you, that it scales as one plus some constant times epsilon, where epsilon is, is the physical noise rate on your chip. This makes kind of sense, right? Because when, when the noise rate epsilon goes to zero, you would expect to have uh, a gamma factor of one, which corresponds to no sampling overhead. So let's assume that you fix the total sampling overhead that you're um, that that you're willing to to accept, right? Which is just other uh, another way to say, okay, you're going to fix how many shots you're willing to do, right? I'm you could say I'm willing to do at most hundred thousand shots, right? How many T gates can you can you then realize under this constraint? And the number of T gates uh, can then be shown to scale as one over epsilon. So really, the smaller the the hardware noise becomes, the better the hardware gets. Basically, the more T gates we can do. So here I have just some uh, okay here uh, so some small picture that just illustrates what I said orally. So here on on the x axis you see the the noise. Uh, rate of the of, on, on the hardware on the y axis you see what is the maximal number of T gates that we can that we can run and the different uh, the red blue and green line are just uh, different values of, of maximum number of shots that we're willing to take and you can see that as epsilon becomes smaller the number of of of, of, of T gates that we can realize really grows extremely quickly. And um, if we assume, right, so, so I'd like to compare now our, our method to, to something a little bit different, and that is classical simulation methods. Because um, when you look at what is the, simul the, 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 the overhead of our, of our technique, it's, it's going to be a, a sampling overhead which scales exponentially in the number of, of T gates, right? This is inherently because we are doing the quasi-probability method. So, while in the original quasi probability method, we had a cost that is exponential in the circuit size. Now we have a cost that's exponential in the number of T gates. And interestingly, this is a behavior that uh, you, you can see at another point also, and that is uh, with classical simulation algorithms, because people have been trying, of course, to, to find the best possible way how you can simulate a quantum circuit on a, on a classical computer. And if you, and if you only have Clifford gates on in your circuit, that is very easy. You can do that efficiently, but as soon as you have, uh, non Clifford gates, it becomes very hard for the computer. And in fact, the best possible classical algorithms, um, typically have a, a, a runtime that is exponential in the number of T gates. So I believe the best, uh, exponent that is known, uh, uh to date is this, uh, value 1.32 to the power of T. And as it turns out, um, it is estimated that with these, these algorithms, you can maybe reach around 50 T gates. Whereas if we assume for, for our method that we have a, a, a gate error rate of around 10 to minus three, which is not so far away from, from what might be physically realizable, we can get significantly more T gates. And again, I'd like to emphasize this again, as the quality of the hardware is going to improve, our exponent here in the overhead is going to decrease more and more. Whereas uh, for the classical simulation algorithm, well, may maybe someone will find a, a little bit of a better algorithm, but in principle, there's no hope that this, this basis of the, of, of the exponential cost is gonna decrease by much. So 
I uh, see that time is running quickly, so at this point, um, I'd like to to get to the to the conclusion. So just to reiterate uh, what I was talking about in the beginning, error mitigation techniques are are some nifty tricks and techniques that allow us to reduce the effect of noise in a very hard, hardware friendly manner on, on near term hardware. But typically, they exhibit some kind of bad scaling because they don't really prolong the coherence times of the qubits. So in the case of the quasi-probability methods, this meant explicitly, explicitly that we have a sampling overhead that scales exponentially in the circuit size. We need to do a number, we need to make a number of shots that is exponential in the circuit size. And when we look at error correction, uh, error correction becomes significantly easier. I, I, I don't want to say it becomes easy, but it becomes easier if we restrict ourselves to, to some non-universal gate set. So we specifically considered um, that we have a, a quantum computer that can realize Clifford gates voltarently. Principle, you might have different codes where, where, where the easy gates are not necessarily Clifford gates. That's actually not something that is fixed in the method. But um, for, for our concrete example that I presented during the presentation, we considered, uh, again, the Clifford gates are the easy gates and non-Clifford gates are the hard gates. And then we, the, our idea is to use error mitigation techniques to, to reach universality, basically by, by realizing these hard gates, or in our case, these were the T gates, uh, in a noisy fashion, and then correcting that noise using the quasi-probability method. And we illustrated two different techniques how you could try to, to, to realize this idea concretely on the hardware. And we, we showed what one was with noisy magic states and the other was uh, with the code switching or code deformation. And we illustrated both of these ideas on, on the surface code. So I think basically the, the takeaway of, of this whole presentation for me is, is a little bit summarized in this table here. I think this very well uh, shows how, how our work, which is, here in the middle compares to what I call their conventional quantum error correction, which is just quantum error correction with uh, magic state distillation and classical simulation of quantum circuits, which we can do on a classical computer. So the big advantage of, of our work compared to conventional quantum error correction is that we can, that we do not actually need any kind of magic state factory. We, so this will be, hopefully uh, much easier to realize uh, on near-term hardware than conventional quantum error correction. Of course, the price that we pay for that is that uh, we now have to, to run more shots of our circuit and the number of shots scales exponentially in the number of T gates. But in contrary to classically, uh, classical simulation, which also uh, exhibits this exponential cost, the basis of the exponent in classical simulation is fixed. Whereas uh, for, for the quasi-probability methods, uh, the, the basis of, of, of the sampling overhead uh, vanishes in the limit where the hardware noise goes to zero. And in fact, even for, for realistic, uh, in a realistic back, back of the envelope calculation with, with noise rates, which are realistic, we, we see that uh, the number of T gates that we could potentially realize with this method is already significantly larger than what we can probably uh, achieve with uh, with classical simulation. So this is going to be hopefully significantly more powerful than a classical computer. And I'd like also to 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 make some two more concluding remarks, which are a bit of more general nature. So one of them is that I think there's going to be many different ways how you can take ideas from error mitigation, error correction. And, and combine them together. So what I presented today is basically just one way how you can do that, but there's probably many, many other ways uh, how, how you can approach this problem because the field of error mitigation is incredibly diverse and, and it's, it's, it, there's several points and several ways how you can try to, to assist quantum error correction with error mitigation. So one other approach that I'd like to point out, which I think is also uh, extremely interesting, but like, that, that, that combines error mitigation, error correction, but in a completely different way than what I presented today, is this is a, is a paper by by Zutsuki et al. Basically, the idea that they have is that um, they assume that we we have again a fault tolerant quantum computer that can even do T gates, 
but you don't really want to run too many T gates, right? Because every T gate is extremely expensive and you want to, 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 to have the smallest magic states factory possible, right? So they consider the, the situation where you're trying to run some, some arbitrary unitary that you decompose using the Solovay key type theorem. So the Solovay key type theorem decomposes a unitary uh, into into Clifford and T gates, and you can choose basically how precise you want this decomposition to be. So if you want to have a very precise decomposition of your unitary, you're going to have a circuit that includes many many T gates, which is very bad because that's not very well realizable on, on the hardware, right? Because you need T gates are expensive. So their idea is to say, well, okay, we're gonna do a sort of a key type decomposition for unitary, but we're going to do a, a, a bad quality approximation, right? We're going to do a decomposition in a much smaller circuit. That means they have a much larger approximation error of the unitary, but they have to run much fewer T gates. And then this approximation error can then be corrected using the quasi-probability methods. So I think that this is just a, a very neat idea that, that goes in, in, in a somewhat similar direction. And another comment that I'd like to make is that the way how I presented, um, basically my how I presented the idea in this talk, I, I basically gave the impression that um, using the quasi-probability method is like a completely separate approach using uh, magic state distillation. It's, it's an alternative, which is technically true. It is an alternative. You, we, we can get rid of magic state distillation by using the quasi-probability method. But in principle, uh, the, the two methods can even be used in conjunction together, right? You might be in the situation where uh, you can run a few rounds of magic state distillation, right? To get somewhat good uh, uh, magic states, which are like not good enough yet for fault tolerance, but they're already better than like the raw magic states that you can usually produce. And then you can take these uh, somewhat less noisy magic state and use them in the quasi-probability decomposition. So basically, what, what this allows you to do by, by, by tuning the number of, 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 um, of distillation steps that you do, you, you have this, this trade-off uh, between distillation overhead, like how many distillation rounds do you do, and sampling overhead, like how, mu how much do you have to pay with additional shots. And of course, uh, what I, you can go in the limits where the distillation overhead is zero, then you have the largest sampling overhead, and then you can get rid completely of the of, of, of the magic state factory. But you can, in principle, also choose other points in that trade-off, right? Maybe it might be advantageous to have a little bit of distillation. Okay, so um, I think that's all from for this and i'd like to thank the audience uh, for your attention and if there's any questions I'll, I'll try my best to answer them okay thanks so much christoph that seems like really really good and important work um we did have uh one question in the chat which i was saying i was going to save for the end okay yes so how practical is this assumption that the clifford gates are more or less able to be performed perfectly. So um, this assumption is not a problem. So it, it is actually correct. Uh, so the way how I presented it, basically this technique in this presentation, I was always working under the assumption that the Clifford gates are basically perfect. There's no error in the, in the Clifford gates. And that's, of course, not true in, in reality, right? So um, you have to be careful how the quasi-probability method interacts together with, with these uh, errors in, in the Clifford gates. But, uh, and, and, and this is something we actually did in, in the paper on the archive. So this is, um, it, it is possible to look at that. And the, the idea of this analysis is to, is, is that every branch of the quasi-probability decomposition, right? Every, every, a uh, random circuit that you're going to sample is going to be Clifford and noisy T gates. And the part, and, and the Clifford part of that circuit, you can make the noise arbitrarily small uh, by, by the standard argument. And uh, yeah, I have some trouble to, to explain that orally. It's, it's not a problem. Uh, you might need a slightly larger distance 
uh, and the analysis in the, is in the paper. I think I'm, I'm going to leave it to that. <laughs> Sorry okay, that cool. I can give a better answer. Yep, yep. So um, I know we're running a little bit short on time here. So I always like to ask people at the end, you know, obviously this work came out in the archive pretty recently. I'm sure you're doing some work to sort of follow up on, on this previous work. Could you sort of talk just briefly about what you might be thinking in, in the future to continue this sort of work? Right. So one, one question that is very important is what kinds of gates can we realize with this method, right? Right now we, we, we consider T gates, but uh, when you decompose uh, a general unitary, it is much more efficient if you could, for example, realize arbitrary Z or arbitrary X rotations, right? Because yeah. then you can significantly reduce the number of gates, gates that you have to do. But unfortunately, uh, once you do that, the, the twirling trick that I was talking about in this presentation doesn't work anymore because the twirling trick uh, is based on, on, on the fact basically that the T-gate is, is a special kind of gate uh, because it's, it's in the third level of the Clifford hierarchy. It's just a, a very specific class of gates. And we use that property of the T-gates to, to do that, that, um, that, that uh, twirling trick. And for general RZ rotations, general RX rotations, you cannot do the twirling trick. And so you will not have a nice logical uh, noise in of, of Pauli Z form. And because of that, it's it's not it's more difficult to realize this gate. So we're so one avenue that I'd like to to, to work in and, 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 and figure out is how we can deal with more general gates besides the T gate. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Cool. I think that makes sense. All right. Well I don't see any more questions in the chat for right now. And I know we're a little bit over time already. So Maybe we'll just wrap up here and I want to thank you again so much for being here with us today and for that really nice talk and for all this important work that you're doing um, and also good luck with the with the rest of your PhD as well. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thanks again. All right. Well, uh, this is the end of our seminar series for today, everybody. So again, remember, if you haven't already, please subscribe. We do these every week on Friday at 12 Eastern time um, on the Kiskit YouTube channel. So thanks so much for your attention this afternoon and have a great rest of your, your Friday.